Let us end this time of meditation by saying together the Buddhist meta medica meditation or loving kindness meditation. I'll say the line and you say it after me should you choose to. We'll say it through three times. The first time we say it for ourselves. May I be free from danger. May I be mentally happy. May I be physically happy. May I have ease of well-being. The second time we say this for someone we love. May you be free from danger. May you be mentally happy. May you be physically happy. May you have ease of well-being. May you have ease of well-being. Now the third time is a spiritual stretch, and this can be part of what makes a meta meditation count as a good spiritual path. We say it for someone against whom we have a resentment. This does not change them. It changes us. May you be free from danger. May you be mentally happy. May you be physically happy. May you have ease of well-being. May it be so. One of the reasons that I wanted us to sing the Oneness of Everything hymn this morning, even though it was kind of complicated and we hadn't sung it before, is because the message is the message of the sermon. Um, we, we are among the traditions that hold light as sacred. The lit chalice is the Unitarian Universalist sacred symbol. It's not the cross. It's not the Star of David, it's the lit chalice. And so I feel that this season of the celebration of the return of the light is particularly important for Unitarian Universalists. But almost all faith groups in the Northern Hemisphere at this time of year are celebrating the return of the light. In the Hindu culture, there's Diwali. In the Jewish culture, there's Hanukkah. In the Christian culture, there's Christmas. In the pagan culture, there's Yule. We're all celebrating the return of the light, and I haven't even mentioned all of them. So, the Hebrew scripture says three sentences that start with the word God is. God is what? God is love, God is spirit, and God is light. So there's something in the deep wisdom of the world that sees the sacredness of light. God is light. So, in the darkest night, that's the time when even the tiniest light can be seen. You know, if you want to see the stars, you've got to go out in the country. You've got to get away from lights in order to see the stars into the deep darkness. And everybody's read books about war, or anyone who's a veteran knows that if you're smoking a cigarette on the battlefield in the dark, the enemy might be able to see you. Even a tiny little glow of the tip of a cigarette can give you away on a dark, dark battlefield. So there's something about the darkness that makes light more powerful. If you're in the dark, you you can't really tell what you're stepping on. You stumble over things. There are noises that scare you because you don't know what they are and things sound different in the dark if you're not used to it. It can be very scary for a human to be walking around in the woods at night. So being in the dark is a kind of a metaphor for not being able to see where to put your feet not being able to see what's coming up on you, being kind of nervous and jumpy. 
and the people, the Jews in Israel were, were in a kind of a dark night in this time where the miracle happened that's celebrated by Hanukkah. The king of Syria was ruling Israel. Syria is where Syria is right now. They haven't changed their name. <laughs> Alexander the Great had conquered Persia, which is now Iran and Iraq, Persia and Syria, in 333 before the Common Era, BCE. 333 is when Alexander the Great had conquered. And so the Greek culture of Alexander the Great and his Greek army had permeated that area. So all the people in the Middle East were Hellenized, especially the um, upper classes. The upper classes had Greek values and Greek beliefs. And here are some Greek values. The body is beautiful, the male body, and it should be taken care of. The female body is kind of a misshapen male. Um, <laughs> You have a girl if the dad at the time of conception had worked too hard that day, or maybe had a cold. Um, <laughs> they believed that there was a world of spirit and a world of matter. And if you were closer to the world of matter, then you were less spiritual. And the farther away you were from the concerns of the flesh, the more spiritual you could be. And so the Greek, these were the Greek values. Um, the boys should be educated, the girls not so much. And um, the, the ideal for a life was to transcend and live completely in the intellect uh, in a body that was very well taken care of. Okay, so those are some Greek values. And as I said, it's mostly the upper classes in Israel and in the whole empire that were um, speaking Greek and educating their sons in the Greek way. And the, the other 47% were um, <laughs> mostly just hanging still onto the Jewish culture um, in, in Israel. So everything was fine. Um, Israel was added to that empire by Antiochus Epiphanes III. He took it from the Egyptians. This was about the same time that the inscriptions were being carved into the Rosetta Stone. That gives you a little context. So Syria took it from the Egyptians, and again, the upper classes were Hellenized, but Antiochus Epiphanes III's son, named Antiochus Epiphanes IV, <laughs> was a kind of crazy um, and wicked. And he decided that everyone, everyone had to become Hellenized and had to let go of their Greek culture, oh, sorry, their Jewish culture and their Jewish language and their Jewish customs, these superstitious Jewish customs, like circumcising your baby sons. And so the penalties that he laid out for parents who had their sons circumcised were horrific. I can't even tell you what they were, they would give you nightmares. So suddenly no one was allowed to circumcise their babies. Um, no one was allowed to speak the language. You weren't allowed to have services in the temple. In fact, what he did to the temple, um, he took the Holy of Holies, which is the place that only the high priest can go into, in the temple, he had his soldiers open it up, trample through it, and then they put a statue of Zeus right in the middle of it. And they polluted and diluted, as soldiers can, uh, can uh, the oil, the holy oil, that was meant to light the lamps in the temple. And the people were groaning under this oppression. And so, a revolt was begun by a small band of Maccabees who were priests of the temple, Maccabees. 
The high priest Mattathias started it. He was head of the Hasmonean family in a small town called Modi. And he and his sons started a revolt. And as a result of that revolt, the Jewish soldiers drove these Syrian Persian Greeks, called the Seleucid Greeks, they drove them out of the land. And they reclaimed the temple, and they had to rededicate the temple. That was the first order of business. So they cleaned it all up, and the high priest went looking for oil that hadn't been defiled. And he found a small vial of holy oil that was still sealed, and he lit the lamps with it. And even though there's absolutely no reason why that oil should have lasted this long, it, the lamps burned for eight days. And that's why there's eight days of Hanukkah, celebrating that miracle of the lights burning long enough for the priest to make more ceremonial oil and keep them going. Okay, so was there really a miracle? I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. It's a faith story. And a faith story is true in a way that is not necessarily historical. A faith story is true in an in here way. And so I think a good way to approach a faith story is as if it were a metaphor, as if it were a dream. As, uh, and a dream is a kind of an as if language. So if you look at your dream or your story or your metaphor at, as if it is telling a story and they're saying, if this were my dream, it would say, it is as if you are surrounded by forces that are pressuring you and making it difficult for you to function according to your values and your faith. Has anybody ever been in a situation like that? I don't know if you've never gone outside of Austin. <laughs> But there are places where it can be very difficult to practice Unitarian Universalist values, where people think you're weird for wanting to affirm the worth and the dignity of every person, where people think the democratic process is something that you just use to get done what you want done instead of allowing it to work, where people don't think you should have a responsible search for truth. They think you should swallow what you've been told and not ask too many questions. Thank you very much. So the values that we affirm and promote, we can be in situations, um, Thanksgiving with the family, where it becomes <laughs> difficult to practice the values that are inside of you. I know that um, I live in a culture that does not affirm and promote my values. I live in a culture that thinks that the highest aspiration of human beings is to buy as much stuff as you can. As much new stuff. As much shiny expensive stuff. And that the more shiny expensive stuff you can buy for yourself and other people, the more successful you are. And I live in a culture that says, um, that you, if you're African American, or if you're of Hispanic descent, that you are worth less than if you're of European descent. And in fact, it's not just an intellectual exercise, it's really how our whole society is structured. It's structured on racism. And our culture says, if you're gay or lesbian, you don't have the rights that other people have. And some people say you should be killed. So you try to avoid those people. <laughs> but you can't always tell who they are by looking. Lots and lots of people think a loving God would send me, someone like me, to a place of eternal hell, fire, and torment. Uh, just because he loves me so much? Uh, something like that, I don't know. <laughs> we live in a culture where ministers tell their church people to throw their gay children out on the street while they're teenagers. 
We live in a crazy culture. It can make it difficult to affirm and promote the faith that we have. So I think we can really all identify with this piece of the story. Another way I can identify with this story is by imagining that I am the temple. That is an ancient metaphor for a person. You are the temple. And we have all felt the times when people have trampled through us, when people have uh, polluted what keeps us going, where people have cast aspersions on on things that we hold dear, where people have, or circumstances have hurt our pride, our sense of ourselves. We've felt turn inside out. We've lost a job or we've lost relationships. We've felt really flattened and filthy. And that's the situation the temple was in, in this story. And furthermore, in this story, in the Holy of Holies, there was a lie, a big lie, right in the middle of the Holy of Holies. What might that mean in your life? Some of us have a big lie right in there in the most sacred space of our heart, where we think there's something wrong with us, or where we think we're sinners deserving of hellfire, or where we think, um, that we have to be perfect, and that mistakes are unacceptable. That's a lie that'll twist you up. Maybe for you the lie is that you're misshapen in some way. People must never see it, so you must keep people at arm's length. Or maybe the lie in your Holy of Holies is that you are so special <laughs> that you have to be more productive more gracious, more successful, get less rest, not have as much fun as those other people. God forbid you should just live your life to enjoy it. And you're so special that the normal rules don't apply to you. That is a lie in the middle of your holy of holies. And it twists you up and turns you inside out. It must be driven out. The statue must be taken down. And so, the first order of business is to clean up the temple, to take out the lie, and then you have to light the lamps. So you look around for something that'll light the lamps, but you're feeling pretty burned out. Every fuel you try kind of sputters. It doesn't really hold the light. So what do you have to do? You have to find some spark. You have to find this <coughs> spark that connects you with the divine. Maybe you find it in church. Maybe you find it in conversation with other people. Maybe you find it when you're hiking or when you're playing music. Everybody has a tiny passion, a tiny spark. You find that spark and you light the lamp. Okay, here's the other thing I love about this story. The high priest did not just use a little of the, of the oil. He didn't, he didn't say, <coughs> Oh, thank you, God, I have found an un, a, a sealed bottle of holy oil. Let's put the holy oil on the shelf and worship it. No. He lit the lamps. He didn't say, I'm just going to take a little of this oil and light one of the lamps and save the rest for later. No, that's not the way you get a miracle. <laughs> you pour it out. You use all the oil. You challenge the universe. He lit the lamps. A lot of us love that way. We go, I will love you as long as you do the things that I want you to do and be the person I would like you to be. And I'll monitor your progress. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I'll give you as much love as accords with how much you were going along with my plan. Oh, my people. That is not how you get a miracle. Sometimes we love our church that way, too. We go, I will love our church and support it as long as my project is the most important one, and as long as nobody disagrees with me, and as long as you do what I want you to do, and as long as I'll just parcel it out, my commitment, my sense of belonging. No, I mean, that's, that's a fine way to be in a church, but it's not the way you get a miracle. You see what I'm saying? I'm not talking about anybody in this church, by the way. <laughs> I've been in other churches. <laughs> if you want a miracle, you have to throw yourself in. Does that make sense? You have to pour it out. That's how you love. That's how you jump into a good project. That's how you get a miracle. And so what I'm telling you is, in this dream of the oil that burned for days, if you want to, to light the light, you pour out the oil. You drive out the lie, and then you light the lamps with everything you've got. And you trust the breath of the divine to keep it going. And what this story says is that there is a mystery out there, and that sometimes something that shouldn't work, works. And that sometimes, as long as you really throw yourself in, then you'll get a longer burn than you think you should. You get a miracle. And so, you light the lamp. You find one good deed to do. You find one person for whom to extend yourself. You find one forgiveness that you need to make. You find one amends that you need to create. One person you need to ask forgiveness of. You you light the lamp, and the ancient story says that it is possible that the divine will keep it burning. That the breath of the Spirit will catch that flame that you've spent your last effort to light and make it bright and make it burn longer than you would have imagined. And that is my bright hope for you at this time of light return. <laughs>